Um, just uh, want to give a shout out to our friends in Singapore. So for those of you here, just a heads up, so the cameras are rolling because there's an audience of a few hundred people in Singapore also watching this stream live right now. Say hi. Woo! To them. Okay. And then also, as I mentioned, the, the BATS and also Singapore Connect were organizers in this event. So just to start off with, um, we're going to the Q&A session now, so many questions. So I'll start off with a question from the other side, and then we go into a question on, on this side of the audience. So here's a question from an audience member the there. The other side means the other side of the Pacific. Yes, yeah. the other side of the Pacific. Yeah, not, not the other side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a question that we have here is, uh, what are some ways we can help our children and youth cultivate compassion mm -hmm. and a sense of power where they can make positive contributions to others? I, I have a theory, and I, I don't know how well this is going to work. Uh, my theory is that compassion is best spread if it's connected to self-interest. It's like, like what? <laughs> so if we talk about compassion, we can talk about it until you turn blue in the face. And people were like, yeah, and then they clap their hands, and then they go home, nothing changes. Right? So, uh, the way I see it, if, if compassion benefits you in addition to benefiting others, then you'll spread. So, so how to do that? I think there are two things. Um, the first thing is that compassion is fun. And when I say fun, what I mean is that compassion, it turns out, is a happy state. It brings happiness to, to the person giving compassion. In fact, I, I'm, not, I'm not just saying it, I have scientific proof that uh, if you measure the brains of somebody who's in a compassionate state, compassion is the happiest state ever measured in the history of neuroscience. Is that happy? Uh, and, and during the measurement, uh, so it was, it was first done on this guy called Mathieu Ricard. He's a Frenchman. Uh, I'm sorry if I tell too much story, yeah. people will bring me back. So, so he's a Frenchman. And uh, the interesting thing about him, he's really, really smart, by the way. He has a PhD in microbiology. Uh, his his, his uh, advisor was a Nobel laureate uh, who had two students, and he was one of those chosen. He was that smart. He was supposed to be, uh, when, when he was growing up, he was supposed to be one of those promising scientists of, of France in the future or something. And then after he got his PhD, what did he decide to do? He decided to become a monk. <laughs> yeah, I know, the career choice for, <laughs> for microbiologists. He decided to become a, a Buddhist monk. Uh, then he went, he, he moved to India and then to Nepal and then he just meditated for 40, 40 years, 40,000 hours of meditation at that time. And so when the Dalai Lama got interested in the science of, the neuroscience of, of meditation, Matthew was the obvious person, right? Because he speaks English, he speaks French, he speaks Tibetan, uh, he's, a, he's a, a bona fide scientist with a PhD in Pasteur Institute and he has 40,000 hours of practice, and he's a true master, meditation master. It's like, this person is a master in both worlds. It's perfect. So they got, they got Matthew, they put in the fMRI, and they measure EEG and so on, and they asked him to, match, to meditate on compassion. And the story was that when he did that, uh, they looked at the equipment, they were like, something is wrong. <laughs> so, so they told him, uh, sorry Matthew, uh, we, had to re we had to recalibrate, something is very wrong, uh, because the numbers are just off the charts. Uh, from what I heard, like eight standard deviations from the mean or something, I mean the happiness level. And then uh, after they recalibrate, they brought him back, same thing. And later on, they have other meditators with 10,000 hours of training or more, same thing. They replicated it. So it's not, it's not, it's not one off. So how happy is Matthew in, in, in compassion? So I, I asked a question to, to Richie, who, who, is, um, who is the principal investigator of this research. And I saw the numbers, I didn't understand it. I saw a spike in the, in the graph. I was like, what does this mean? I said, Explain it to me in words that even I can understand. So uh, Richie said, imagine this. Imagine an elephant charging at you. Imagine the fear you have seeing that elephant charging at you. Imagine having the positive side of that, I mean the, the positivity with that intensity. And imagine doing this on demand in two seconds or voluntarily bringing that up. He said, that's what Matthew did. That much happiness in one or two seconds on demand. And he did that by uh, bringing out a feeling of compassion. So 
Once you understand that compassion is a happy state, you are doing it for yourself. It makes you happy. Then it's easier to spread. So that's one. Uh, going beyond that, even better than, than uh, uh, happiness is, for Singaporeans at, at least, is success. <laughs> compassion is very conducive to success, especially as a leader. Uh, so now I'm quoting from my book. So read my damn book. <laughs> Which is uh, the, uh, the type of leader, there's a, there's a specific kind of leaders who are highly effective. They're called good to great leaders. They are the type of leaders who bring organizations from good to great. And they, are very, they have a very specific quality about them. So in addition to being competent, of course, that's a baseline. They are very good CEOs and they have two uh, qualities. They are humble and they are ambitious at the same time. Personally humble and ambitious, highly ambitious. So how do you explain that, right? So it turns out that the way it works is these people, they care a lot for the greater good. They don't care about themselves that much. And because of that, they are ambitious for doing good for the greater good. And at the same time, because they don't care much about themselves, they are humble. And it turns out those are the perfect leaders because they are very inspiring. And, they, and everybody wants to work for them and they achieve a lot in the team. So if you look at level five leaders, the question you should be asking is how do you train them? Now, there are two questions. First, is it trainable? If it's trainable, how do you train them? I want to argue it's trainable. And here's why. If you look at compassion, compassion has three, uh, three parts. There is uh, three components. There's an affective component. Affective as in I feel for you, the feeling. There's a cognitive component, which is I understand you. There is a motivational component, which is I want to help you. You superimpose this three on the two qualities of level five leaders. The first two, I understand you, I want, and I feel for you, they downregulate your ego, thereby strengthening humility. Uh, I want to help you. The motivation strengthens ambition for greater good. Therefore, compassion is a necessary and insufficient condition for level five leadership. Therefore, to train a level five leader, you need to train compassion. It's trainable. So therefore, for, uh, for parents watching from home, I think this is, this is the, the secret. It is for self-interest. It makes you happy and it makes you more effective. And if you understand that, and if the kid understands that, then there's incentive to be compassionate. Thank you, Chan. Thank you, Chan Ming. Um, so, no, self-interest works here. <laughs> Any questions from this audience? I wasn't thinking a lot of questions. I'll run back to the mic. Hi, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Um, uh, your name, please? I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Um, so my question is, there are a lot of organizations already in the world that are trying to do like a similar thing to what you're doing, like getting people together. There's like random acts of kindness. There's like Oprah, like a ton of things. So what, how... Why, what, gives you, what makes you think that this will be like, different? Or like, how do you feel like this is um, working with what is already existing? Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of how not to be offensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK. I, I'm going to say something that I'm, it's, I'm, I'm sure is not offensive, but this may, may or may not offend a few people which is a uh, same attitude, which is try and see if it works. Right? So, so the reason we did it is because, I mean, there are other people who would, would, would do that, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. So it's not really competition. It's not, that, not really saying they're not doing well enough. It's like, we should all give it a try. I mean, there's nothing stopping us from trying. So that's why we're doing it. Uh, then the question is, what, what difference is us? There are a couple of things. Uh, the first is scale. Uh, the second is uh, mes measure measurement, uh, measurability. So, so I know I'm aware of campaigns like this, but they, it's, like, it's like a one-off, like it's a one-day thing or a couple of days thing. And then there's no measurement. There's nobody measuring a million X of kindness or whatever. So we're actually measuring it, and we're in for the long term. 
Right? So uh, Don Ivan has been doing it since like 96 or something, and we're, we are still doing it. The 13 Nobel laureates are still behind us. And the other, the other thing we have is 13 Nobel Peace laureates. It, is, uh, it turns out it's tremendously hard to get 13 Nobel Peace laureates together to do anything. <laughs> and and we, we, we have that. Uh, and what 13 Nobel laureates give us, uh, besides credibility, there's one other thing, which is surprising. I mean, retroactively not surprising. Once you hear it, you go like, duh. But before you hear it, it's kind of surprising, which is integrity. Because the Nobels, they are very concerned about their own reputation, which they should be, right? So therefore, they, are very care, they care about their finances. They, I mean, our, how we report finances, they care about how we spend money, they, and they care about those details. And because of that, we, our integrity has to be very high. So it sounds like a limitation, but it's actually a good thing because it keeps us honest. So I think the combination of those factors and the other factor that's uh, in, in our advantage is, is, uh, is we're getting buy-in from, from the big companies. Uh, so for example, uh, Google is a big example. Uh, Google is, is behind us. We have 100 volunteers in Google back when I was working there. Uh, Susan, uh, the CEO of YouTube, is one of our sponsors. So, and and this, uh, YouTube gives us a lot of free airtime. And Google donates uh, advertise, free advertising to us. So if we do that, and if we can scale that beyond Google, the Facebooks, the world, uh, Twitters of the world, and so on, I think eventually we can create a massive movement that will actually work. And the reason it hasn't worked so far is because it's hard. It's not that nobody has tried. It's just really, really hard. And I think that to, we have the right combination of factors that gives us a non-zero probability of success. Yeah, yeah I, I used to tell a joke. Uh, I mean, it's actually true. I, I like to say, I, I say that uh, when I started trying to create the conditions for world peace, I knew it was impossible. I just didn't know it would be hard. <laughs> and it turns out uh, it, went from it went from impossible to hard when I realized it's not impossible. There's a non-zero probability of actual success. And that's how it became really, really hard. I say hi, Rachel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chad Ming. Yes. Okay. Um, another question. From there. Hello, um, I'm Valerie. So I have two questions. One is you talked about acts of peace, and what would you define as really like an act of peace itself? Because like it could. Like there are many different forms. So, what do you define as peace, yes. um, and how do you measure like that it actually created peace? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, um, seeing that you guys have recorded so many different kinds of ways of people of doing acts of peace, have you thought of um, doing something that's like a best practices or a guidebook for how can people more effectively or more easily be able to do this kind of acts of peace? Yeah. Right. Uh, the first question: uh, Are you an engineer, by the way? Uh, no, I'm not an no, okay. engineer. It's a very engineer question, uh, in, a, in a good way. <laughs> the definition of an act of peace is any action that is taken deliberately towards solving one of these ten problems, one of the ten problems in the world. Uh, so if you, if you think about that definition, you find that the, the, the key word is intention. Right, we, what we want are intention towards solving the problems. Any action is taken deliberately to try to do any of this. Even a small one is an act of peace in, in our definition. Uh, there is a problem with that definition. There are a couple of problems. Right? One of the big problems is it, do, it doesn't measure granularity. It doesn't measure the size of the, of the act of peace. So if, if, I, if I give one meal to a homeless person versus I feed all the people in San Francisco, they're both one act of peace. Some, yeah, so how do you solve the problem? We don't know yet. We're going to figure this out. I mean, there are a couple of partial solutions. One partial solution is to measure input, right? So how many people are involved? Right? So for example, uh, Tenzin's, Tenzin's project of providing water to a village, eight people are involved, so we count it eight, eight acts of peace versus one. So, so the, uh, uh, the assumption is, is that uh, input approximates output. And then the next question, next idea is, let's measure impact. But that is hard. Right? Uh, you, you, you feed, I don't know, you do something for 10 people, you feed 10 people versus you save one man's life. 
that's 10 versus 1. How do you quantify it? It's very hard. So it's an open question. Uh, the real answer is I don't know the answer, but we're trying to figure that out. Uh, however, in the meantime, what we really care about is the intention because we care about tourists to travel to guide. And therefore, as long as with the intention, we can bring people there, that counts. And ultimately, what, really cares, what I really care about is to, is to create a community of millions of change makers. So that's one. Uh, quest, next question is how do we count it? Uh, right now, it's by self-reporting, which again is uh, <coughs> not good enough. It is, it is adequate, but can be a lot better. Self-reporting, a lot of people don't self-report. Uh, because there's a barrier, it takes time. Okay? Uh, and even if people who want to do it, sometimes they're shy. Okay? So all I did was feed the guy. Okay? I, mean, I mean, it happens to me, by, by the way. Right? So when we were doing this, uh, Don and Ivan was like, why don't, you like your, why don't you just lock your act of peace for the past month? I said, I, I, said, I didn't do anything. And then I had to think back, oh yeah, actually I, I did a non-zero amount of things. I actually did this, I did that. But I just didn't think about it. And it's not just because I'm nice, right? but I think a lot of people have this same, same problem. So if we capture input by, by uh, manual input, we have this problem. So there has to be another way. Uh, so and in other words, these are all open problems, which I have, I, we don't know how to solve yet. And we're hoping to raise $1 million to help solve those problems. Uh, your other question, I don't remember. Can you? Oh, best practices. Best practices, uh, not yet. But it's, it's a really good idea. So we have some approximation of that, which is our Hero Awards. Right? But it's not widely, it's not widely uh, 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 promoted. Uh, I think eventually when we have enough data, then we can start promoting those things. Mm, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, this lady and then this lady. Right. That one is coming over. Um, hi, I'm Gloria. Thank you so much Gloria. for the inspiring talk. Um, building on the question about measurement of impact, I wanted to hear your opinions of like this, the kind of controversial space of like Peter Singer and effective altruism, and whether you think that is a potential approach, why or why not? I'm sorry, what is it again? Uh, effective altruism. Why is that? Which is the idea that like impact can be measured in very financial and utilitarian terms, like characterizing, say, the number of lives saved based on like dollars spent, or in this case, maybe hours of time spent, or something like that. Yeah, the the, the real answer is I don't I don't know. I mean, it's, it sounds like group approximations. Uh, my my thinking at this time, and again, I if I get more data, I might change my mind. My thinking at this time is some measurement is better than no measurement. And sometimes, uh, even bad measurements are good because you can, do, you can then do correlation. And if you can do correlation, then you can find best practices. I'll give you a simple example. There is an effort, I think, from Australia to measure peace. So we say we're trying to create world peace. But what does that mean, right? How do you measure world peace? How do you measure peace in the society? And uh, if I remember correctly, so. I'm not, I don't have Google right now, so I may be wrong. If I remember correctly, they are, what they're measuring is, uh, is basically, the, the, they make assumptions about factors. So number of people incarcerated, number of violent crimes, and so on. Right? So they, they measure a few of those things, and then they combine it, aggregate it into like a number. Which, in other words, they are measuring uh, violence. And so the assumption is that peace is the negative of violence, the absence of violence. And first, the first thing you look at, if, I mean, if you look at the number, I look at the number, first thought is not good enough. At the same time, uh, they have been able to do correlational studies. They've been able to, to demonstrate if you do this or do that, it changes those numbers. And once you can do that, you say, wait a minute, this is actually really useful. Right? If you like, reduce the number of guns or whatever it is, if you have uh, more education in school and so on, you don't really know what, what happens, but if you can measure, they say, oh, actually reduces violence by 10% in two years, which should do more of it. So uh, on our end, yeah, I would say any measurement is better than nothing, and I welcome uh, more measurements. There's a question here. So after this one, we'll take a question from the Singapore audience. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Lee Han. Thanks Hi, again Han. For, for coming. Um, so my question is around your definition of sort of compassion and happiness. And I think that's really fabulous that compassion, you know, creates that state for individuals. But I think a lot of the problems of the world come from the fact that people don't actually aspire to happiness, right? A lot of people aspire to power. A lot of people aspire to being correct, right? ISIS, you know, whatever. I think a lot of the world's problems come from the fact that people don't, I don't know, maybe don't care about happiness. So what is your take on that? And, and how are we going to then create a better world if people don't care to be happy? I, I disagree with that. Uh, I think that people are, everybody is motivated by two things. Uh, trying to reduce pain and suffering and trying to maximize pleasure and happiness. So if you, I think that like, if you look at everything that everybody does, is what, at least one of these two factors. That everything just say can be explained by one of these things. Like, like, like uh, trying to, trying to like, buff out your ego. It has relates, relates to one thing to be. Uh, there's a, there's a, what do you call it? A reward signal in, in status. So they're pursuing the reward signal in the brain. So in that sense, towards happiness or towards joy. And uh, sometimes because they want to be, they want to power the ego because they don't want to be bullied anymore. So it's avoiding, running away from pain. So I think that all actions taken by human beings, consciously or unconsciously, is motivated by those things. So therefore I disagree with the premise. Mm. So, just to extend the argument, so take mm. a very violent act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so sorry. That, so that Singapore can hear. Yeah, Otherwise, they feel left out. So, so just, to, just to take it to the next level, so let's take a very violent act. This is, let's take gun violence in America, right? Big topic right now. So, um, you know, do you think that a person then derives happiness from committing an act of violence then? Maybe not. Uh, maybe not. Maybe they're trying to avoid pain. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, there's something else which, no, that's off topic. I'll talk about it later. Sure. Okay. Singapore. Yes, there's yes. a question on Singapore. So I'm going to revert one of the questions there. But so many of us are really busy and hectic. You know, life is in the way, there's much to do. Um, what can we do? You know, what, what do you think, how would you encourage us to participate? And what do you think someone's busy in and out every day just doing work could engage in this? Could engage. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I mean, I'm just remembering my life from Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> um, we don't have time. None of us have time for anything. However, we have time for one thing, which is fun. We all have time for fun. Right? If we don't have time for fun, we make, we make time. We make time to play video games. We make time to play basketball. We make time for, to meet people we like to meet with. So the secret is, how do you make this fun? Or rather, how do you make this contribute to your happiness? Uh, it's actually not an easy problem to solve, but I think that's the direction to think about. And uh, the way I, my suggestion is to check your mental state and uh, attend to the joyful feeling when, when you're doing something. So, for example, very small things, right? Uh, so start, start with very selfish small things. Uh, we, when you're eating. When you're eating, the first, the first bite, you're hungry, the first bite, oh, delicious. Right? If you are paying attention to that, then you increase your joy. And if you pay attention a lot, or you're taking a shower, like the first, oh, wow, uh, <laughs> right? right? If you pay attention to that, then your mind becomes uh, familiarized with that experience of joy. And because the mind becomes familiarized, the mind becomes more sensitive to it and sees it more. And therefore, those activities become more joyful. So using the same principle, and by the way, that's the secret to a happy life, or one of the secrets. The other secret to a happy life, let me see, I want to do this experiment, but I don't know if we can do this in Singapore. Okay, let's, I'm going to give the instruction to the room, and for Singapore, this is the same instruction, if you can do this, do this. Which is, uh, this is a 10 second experiment. For 10 seconds, I'd like all of you to identify secretly, secretly, Identify two human beings in this room and then wish for those people to be happy. Okay, just don't say out loud. Okay, so it's otherwise quite embarrassing. Okay. So just don't say anything, don't do anything, just think. Just think. I wish for that guy to be happy. I wish for that guy to be happy. And don't go like, oh. <laughs> like don't don't do that. Shall we try that for ten seconds? 
Okay, 10 seconds beginning now. Okay, that was 10 seconds. Uh, are you happy already? I mean, you notice that everybody in this room is smiling, right, when you did that. You notice something very important once, once you do that, which is to be on the giving end of a kind thought. It's intrinsically rewarding. You didn't even do anything or say anything. It's just, it's just a thought, and, and you didn't even receive anything. It's just thinking. And that, my friends, is one of the secrets of happiness. It is kindness. Uh, loving kindness in specifically. And uh, my opinion, uh, my theory, is that this is part of our evolutionary heritage. Right? Human beings are ultra-social creatures. And to be ultra-social, uh, there, has to, be neuro there has, to, has to be neurological mechanism to make that happen. And I think this is the mechanism. Right? To be on the giving end of kind thought is rewarding. Therefore, that creates ultra-sociality. And if that's true, uh, by the way, uh, how, how far can you push this? I once gave a talk on a Monday night, and we did this, we did this uh, experiment, and I told the audience, tomorrow is Tuesday, it's a work day, try this experiment. Uh, when you go to work, every hour, spend 10 seconds randomly, secretly wishing for two people to be happy, and go back to work. Right? Nothing changed, takes no time, and you're thinking, so it's not embarrassing. Nobody knows you're doing this. See what happens. So that was Monday night. Wednesday morning, I received an email from a total stranger. And she said, I, I hate my job. I hate coming to work every single day. But I did the homework on Tuesday, and Tuesday was my happiest day in seven years. Happiest day in seven years. What did it take? It took 80 seconds of thinking. So therefore, uh, the secret is to find the joy in kindness and in compassion. So first, the mental state itself. The mental state itself is joyful. So find the joy. Second, the action relating to the mental state. The action is also joyful. And, and once you find it, by the way, I, in an extreme example, uh, somebody in this room right now, uh, I, won't, I won't point her out not to embarrass her, but Vanessa knows she knows who, is, who she is. Vanessa over here, uh, she works with dying people. Right. I mean, for, for, even for me, it's like, that sounds like hard work. And yet, for her, she, she derives joy. That's her thing. And so, this is an uh, example of expression of compassion that brings joy. So, find, so first, uh, first know that this is joy, could be joyful, at least entertain the notion. When, when the mental state arises, joy, kindness and compassion, and then joy arises, pay attention to the mental state. When they are acting in kindness or compassion, check for any joy that arises. And I think that is the solution. And eventually, if you can find the joy, the actions will follow. Make sense? Yeah, okay. All right, I think we have time for two more questions. We'll do one over here and one from the Singapore side. So let's do one over here first. Okay, you choose. Hi. Uh, Hi. Your name is? Ilun. Nice Hi, to Yilun. meet you. And thanks for the talk. Uh, okay, so two months ago, uh, I made a trip down to Myanmar for two purposes. One, to visit a friend for fun. Um, the other one is to actually do some good work. Okay, so together with my friend, we visited schools, orphanage, and I will bring a bunch of money that I raised fun on my own and some medic medical supplies. So this is what I see. Most of these orphanages and schools, they're so poor um, that the only source of their funds are from donations. But clearly that's not enough, right? Because it's donation, right? People are poor themselves. Uh, so... Um, most of the schools, they will have problems like uh, broken tables or not even tables. Children will be wearing clothes that are really dirty, not because they don't want to wash, but it's just that even after washing, it gets moldy. So, and that's not the worst case. The case that I've seen were like kids with skin problems. There will be worms crawling all over their faces. 
there will be fungi growth all over. So um, the things that I brought over were useful to them, um, skin supplies and so forth. But it's not enough. So um, at the end of the trip, I kind of have lots of emotions that uh, just arise. Happiness, of course. The kids are really cute, trust me. You know, I don't speak their language, but you know, uh, you interact with them, play games with them, it's really, it's happiness, that's one. Um, the other ones, the other feelings are like humble, humbleness, because people are poor, but yet they are willing to do, uh, still contribute their every bit uh, to help kids or even people poorer than themselves. And one of the most important, uh, more obvious feelings that I'm feeling is that uh, the one of the words that you actually use, powerless. So with that in mind, I'm just wondering, say, if I see a school that I know really need help, so they are managed by two nuns with no education, okay? And they take in 500 village kids and about 100 kids whereby they host in their own school. So the daytime is, is a school, and nighttime is a hostel. Um, how, if I could use your technology, how could I use this to actually do something for them? That would be my question. Thank you. I don't really know. Uh, but I want to make another point, which, thanks, thanks for raising this. this. What you just raised is really important, uh, which is, so I, I asked Matthew this question, by the way. I, I, was, I, was, I was with him in Paris, we were drinking coffee together. I was like, I know you're the happiest man in the world, blah, blah, blah. But, and I said the problem with suffering, I mean the problem with compassion is that you have to see suffering all the time. So how do you see suffering? And, and, and if you see suffering, you get sad. I, mean, I get sad. How do you deal with that? Do you like not feel sad? Do you... Like, what do you do? Like, that's what I asked him. And uh, the, the answer he gave me was, was very powerful. Uh, he says that uh, sadness is really important in compassion. It's, it comes with the happiness. And the, the key point is this. The key point is to have healthy sadness. So it's okay. What does that mean? What is healthy sadness versus unhealthy sadness? And Matthew says healthy sadness is sadness without despair. Despair is the killer. Despair makes sadness unhealthy, and not just make it unhealthy, it destroys everything else. It destroys future action. It destroys the happiness. However, if you feel sad without the despair, then uh, it's more motivational. It's like, I feel so sad, and I'll see what I can do. So, so my, advice, my first advice to you is check for despair, and try to have sadness without the despair. So that's the first part. The question, of course, is how. Okay. But first, first, that's important. Just keep it in mind. Send us over despair. Uh, the way to do that, in my opinion, and again, I could be wrong, and this is my current understanding. The way to do that is to understand the difference between, uh, how should I say, uh, there is a state of mind where there is, or rather, you understand that there is I'm going to use religious terms because I heard it in a religious way and it's beautiful, which is that I am entitled to the effort. Only God is entitled to the outcome. So therefore, all I can do is to put in effort and whether the effort succeeds or not, not up to me, up to him. Right? And so once you have that frame of mind, then I think that checks the despair because I've done my part. Uh, what happens up to the, up to the, the divine. Uh, another way to put it is as a farmer, the farmer uh, prepares the ground, right? plants the seed, waters and everything. And the farmer says, a good farmer will say, okay, I've done everything I needed to do. Now what happens whether it grows or not grow? Not to me, up to the almighty. So the farmer, a good farmer knows what he can control, what he cannot control. And what he can control, the planting, the the weeding, the watering, he puts all the effort, and then the outcome, he leaves it up to the divine. So I'd like to suggest that as an attitude. Put in the effort, leave the outcome to the divine, and check for, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, despair. Does that help? 
Apologies. Just one more clarification. Um, thanks for your advice. I think it's definitely useful. Uh, but I'm not quite at a stage where I'm feeling despair. No. I'm more... I mean, the first thing when I see such a situation, I was thinking about logistics. Like, how many logistics. Like, how am I supposed to get things? The resources I need. Uh, the people I need to get to know. And it's like... Um, it's Myanmar, so, so it's previously a military government, right? Yeah. So there are lots of obstacles that I have to go through. So when I say I feel helpless, in a sense that I'm seeing that there's tons of things I have to do, but I have no connection. I, I can't find or I do not know who should I be looking for um, to get something done. You know, um, I, I probably need a team, but when I ask the question about uh, whether your technology provides that, it's more like, um, is it something like a crowdfunding website that I could actually find the people I need or find the resources I require to actually do something? Um, it's definitely not to the point that I'm despair about it, but it's more like, what's my next step? Uh, something done. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yes, eventually you want to build something like that. Right? Right. Eventually. Uh, in the meantime, I don't know. I'm just trying to raise a million dollars. <laughs> okay, last question from Singapore. Yes, last question from Singapore. So the question is about the government's participation. Oh. So how do you think the government's uh, role and participation would, uh, would play out? And do you think that would change perceptions? Well, ask me about Zheng Hu very dangerously. <laughs> Lucky I'm here. If I say something wrong... I <laughs> okay, I can, make a, can I make a Singaporean joke? Uh, 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 so so uh, we like to say that uh, people ask, my, my, my American friends ask, like, do you have uh, freedom of speech in Singapore? I say, of course I have freedom of speech. We just don't have freedom after speech, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> but good thing I hear our hang. Uh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, having said that, all kidding aside, uh, the, I mean, if you look at the Singapore government, uh, you find that in many ways it's a blessing, right? Uh, the first thing you find, which is an anomaly, which is, is there's no corruption. That's huge, right? I, in the, if, especially in a third world country, that's huge. And I think, I think that one thing is most responsible for Singapore's success, more than anything else. In addition to non-corruptibility, uh, we, 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 we also have some of the best people in the country being in positions of power. Like people like I personally know who are upright, who are good moral character, really smart and really nice. Like, and we were those people in government. It's amazing. And government has resources. Like in Singapore, say, what, Hu Wului. Which is true, yes. <laughs> and because of that, uh, the government has a disproportionate role to play in Singapore. Unfortunately, too much of a role, right? Because government do so much there's not enough opportunity for everybody else to grow. Uh, so uh, my, answer, my answer to this question is, uh, first, yes. I think the government has a role. Uh, and my, my hope is to see... Okay, I'm going to tell you out loud. My hope is to see Singapore as one of the centers in the world for wisdom and compassion. And we used to be... A, we used to be known as the Singapore miracle, the success stories, the, the economic success, the financial success. And then what? And I think our next stage, after beyond SG50, for the next 50 years, I'd like to see Singapore grow into a center where people associate with wisdom and compassion. And I'm not sure how yet, but I'm, I, want, I want to see that, and I, I think Billion Expo Peace could be a big piece. I want to see Singapore do 50 million, right? disproportionately num high number of Expo Peace. Uh, so I let government involve, and also uh, this is an opportunity to grow grassroots leaders. So in addition to government involvement, I like to be, and I don't know how this is going to play out, uh, for the grassroots to emerge, the leaders to emerge by themselves. And hopefully we'll have many, many leaders in Singapore outside of government working in addition to the government and then hopefully Singapore will become a center for wisdom and compassion for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Chan Ming. Just, um, so on behalf of Coursera Bats and Singapore Connect, I'd like to 
with your presence. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>